welcome to Pop and Lock. I'm Landry Ayers. And I'm Natalie Dalzicki. With the presidential election now firmly behind us, we thought we would get away from the political scandal and heavy-hearted stories of conspiratorial government overreach and enjoy a nice, light-hearted fantasy movie written by William Goldman, The Princess Bri- Oh, hold on. I'm being handed something. Uh, I'm now being told that we are, in fact, covering Goldman's critically acclaimed 1972 political thriller, All the President's Men, starring Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. Uh, so a different tale of adventure and daring do, I guess. <laughs> uh, joining us today to break this scandal wide open are Cato Research Fellow in Homeland Security and Civil Liberties, Patrick Eddington. Hello. Cato Institute Vice President, Gene Healy. Hi. And tech and innovation editor for libertarianism.org, our very own Paul Matsko. As you wish. <laughs> all right. So we're going to go with the baseline assumption that all of our listeners know what Watergate is, even if they haven't seen this movie, though it's a classic. So if you have, if you're listening and you haven't seen this movie, you should probably stop listening and go watch and then come back and listen. But I'm more interested in what this movie got wrong. Would you say the movie was accurate? Well, I guess I can pop in here. I, I'm a historian of the 60s. So it is something and in, in, um, I've taught about Watergate in the, in the bunch of classes. And I would say it's not that it is um, that the details are all quite right. Like the, the actual process of how they, you know, they ran down one lead to the next is very much in keeping with uh, the book that was written by uh, by the two journalists. Um, it's it's so so the, the nitty gritty is actually quite on on point. Um, there are a few bits that are inventive, like uh, at the end, it is implied that they're being followed and that their lives may be at danger. Uh, that's enhanced for the film. Uh, there is no evidence that they actually that the post reporters were themselves wiretapped. Um, or that they were followed or that their lives were actually in danger. Now they, they thought they were for a time they've talked about that. And like, it's believable in the context of the time that they might be uh, because that's the kind of thing that the, that the creep the committee to reelect the president and that the FBI was doing all the time. So it's, it's a bit paranoid, but again, understandable paranoia, but they don't, they never say in the movie that like, oh, we were just being paranoid. They imply that this is real, that someone's about to get them. I would say that, you know, although I like the movie, uh, it'd be a terrible way to learn about Watergate. <laughs> uh, you know, even in 1976, when this uh, the details were probably much more present in the public mind, uh, I still feel like people would be, uh, wait, who's Segretti again? What's the Canuck story? Uh, there is very little... Uh, explication of this uh, of this little slice of Watergate. There is um, no there is no Star Wars style crawl at the beginning of the movie <laughs> to tell you right. what the background is. So you know, for a certain generation, they're going to be lost. So, and, and that's why I think it's a it's essentially a film noir that's about history. Uh, it's a detective story where there are sinister, shadowy forces. Uh, you know, Warner Brothers actually build it in some of its. Uh, uh, advertising as a detective story. And like a lot of film noir, the mood is a lot more important than the plot uh, because unpacking the plot, uh, you know, I probably know more about Watergate than the average 21st century American. Uh, but track, you know, following the money from one person to the next and trying to figure out what they're doing, uh, it is very difficult. So if you, you know, if this is shown to a high school class, uh, mostly what they're going to get out of it uh, is Nixon was up to some bad stuff and they're going to get an enjoyable political thriller. Uh, but, you know, as a, uh, a piece of history, uh, although it's mostly accurate in the particulars, uh, you really don't get the full picture. Well, did this movie have an impact greater than the Watergate scandal itself and the investigations? Like, w w did this movie bring any sort of uh, – did it shine even more of a spotlight on this or did it skew the, the history that had been happening? Uh, for instance, the – 
cultural reaction and the use of follow the money as a as a phrase is not in the book in that phrase and is from what I understand not exactly ever said to Woodward and Bernstein. So what does the movie do to the cultural history of the Watergate scandal compared to what actually happened? As I think about it, you know, it, it, as, and I think as Gene has kind of pointed out, um, it, it gave rise to essentially a whole genre of conspiracy related films. And by the way, this was all wonderful for Hal Holbrook's career. Um, the guy who actually plays Deep Throat in this, uh, or Mark Felt, because he goes on to be in uh, a number of other films in the 1970s uh, where you've got this going on. So Mag Magnum Force with Clint Eastwood, where Holbrook is, in fact, the guy running the death squad, the police death squad oh, I forgot uh, about that, in, yeah. in, in the San Francisco Police Department. And then uh, in one of my one of my personal favorites, uh, this is a movie that, that maybe not a lot of people remember or have seen in a long time, but Capricorn One. Oh yeah, uh, which which starred Hal Holbrook, uh, James Brolin, and uh, O.J. Simpson, right? <laughs> uh, uh, which is which is which is kind of interesting uh, in and of itself. In the great Sam Waterston, and you know that in that movie, um, Holbrook plays this uh, essentially compromised, corrupt director of NASA uh, who winds up sending these guys, uh, you know, getting ready to send them to Mars, and then they get pulled out of the capsule at the last minute. I know I'm going like completely off of, you know, what we're supposed to be talking about here. But um, anyway, it was a big conspiracy to cover up the fact they, that they- They, they faked the they Mars landing. They, they faked the Mars landing, right? Yeah. So, and, and right. of course, you know, it's in this period that people begin to say, well, we never went, really went to the moon and so on and so forth. So I think in a lot of respects- you know, the, the movie really did kind of help channel and, and help fuel this whole idea that you can't trust the government. And this goes, obviously, into our current environment. Um, but it also, for me, I mean, it touches on my favorite, uh, my favorite television show uh, of the 1990s, The X-Files, um, which is just, you know, replete with, with all of this. So anyway. It is, uh, I do think it is on topic, though, because uh, all the president's men, is of a piece with the with all these paranoid political films that are coming out in the mid seventies. Uh, you know, uh, Redford, uh, who's the star and producer of uh, All the President's Men, who's uh, in Three Days of the Condor, is a CIA analyst who's great uh, movie. Being tracked great and, movie. Yeah, yeah, you know, for assassination by his government. Uh, the director, Alan Pakula, is. Uh, this is supposedly part of a trilogy of paranoid political thrillers. Uh, he made one of the others is uh, with Warren Beatty, The Parallax View, about this uh, is sort of a proto uh, uh, born identity where there's a, you know, a team of political assassins. And it's very different than uh, most of the movies you'd seen in the decades before because uh, it becomes this thing. Uh, a, a standard uh, element of political thr thrillers in the 70s that the U.S. government is out to get the hero, may even want to kill the hero. Uh, and I think that uh, had a lot to do with what uh, Watergate uh, helped shake out, uh, which is, you know, there were a number of congressional investigations. Pat knows this uh, even better than I do. Um, during the period where you were finding out about, uh, you know, FBI programs like COINTEL, COINTEL Pro, uh, Operation Chaos by the, by the CIA, um, assassination plots by the CIA, which were, you know, almost without fail, much more inept and, uh, <laughs> uh, than, than they were in the movies. Uh, but uh, there was this real cultural moment where uh, – you know, the, the government, the, the American government is no longer the good guy as it, as it was much more frequently in movies of the 50s and early 60s. Uh, and, uh, you know, All the President's Men is right, fits right into that whole trend. I mean, I'll, I'll note uh, one quick thing, which is that uh, while the, the names and the details are going to feel very alien to contemporary audiences, and it always is for my students. Um, 
they don't know who, who these people are. You know, um, uh, who's Coulson? Who's Haldeman? Who's let alone the more minor characters? Yeah, as someone um, who was in high school at, within the past, uh, oh gosh. I don't want to say now. Now it's too long. <laughs> don't uh, date we did, yourself. <laughs> we did not learn enough about Watergate. And so I knew very little going into this movie. <laughs> <laughs> but these would have been household names in 1976. Um, you know, right? Like it, they have just come off of uh, four years now of Watergate investigations. Now, obviously, that's ramping up over those four years. Uh, it's 1976. 1972 is when our movie starts. So the first article's. You know, the burglary is it happens. The first articles start to come out. There's congressional investigation. So you've had four years. Imagine the context would be right now. Are there relatively minor players in the Trump administration's various scandals that would be household names, but will be completely forgotten in 40 years? Well, sure. I mean, household name, Anthony Scaramucci. Yeah. He's going to be completely <laughs> forgotten in 40 years. He was in he was in his position for what, a week? Right. But he's a household name. So the same thing's true. We have to remember that uh, in in 1976, this would have they didn't have to explain all this via Star Wars screen crawl. Uh, people have been talking about this for four years. Um, and also it was being covered by network news by that point. And back then, the amount of media, we were a lot more homogenous in the kind of media we consumed. So people are hearing this on the nightly news that people actually people under the age of 70 used to watch back then. Right. Like uh, everyone's watching Walter Cronkite talk about Watergate and, and so on. So, again, we have to kind of think about the time. That, that's right. People were more, uh, you know, my parents, uh, I was too young to remember, but my parents would, you know, watch this thing obsessively. So, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, names like McCord and Segretti are probably known to them. Um, you know, maybe the Canuck story. Uh, it, I actually had to look up. I knew there was something with the. Uh, Senator Edmund Muskie, uh, who was viewed as Nixon's, you know, maybe my most formidable potential opponent. And uh, they they forge a letter to the editor saying that Muskie had made disparaging remarks about French Canadians. <laughs> and uh, he, get, he gets angry and uh, denies it and uh, supposedly cries several times while he's denying the charge. And that tanks his campaign, you know. But to uh, somebody who didn't grow up uh, and didn't, uh, you know, watch it with Walter Cronkite every night, uh, it does seem like uh, it, it, it's it's very hard to get the context without Wikipedia. And and I think w one of the things that I loved about the movie um, is how it conveys the real conflict, essentially, in the newsroom and and with the publisher. And the concern mm -hmm. about getting it right and all the rest of that. And I, and I recently rewatched uh, Good Night and Good Luck with with George Clooney. And Great movie. The Great movie. Oh, the magnificent David Strathairn, one of my favorite actors of all time as, as Murrow. And, you know, it, that was in the McCarthy era, right? And so there was enough paranoia then. But you can still see and concern, essentially, about potentially being targeted. But you can still see that, you know, ultimately – uh, here, where they are being held, you know, to an extremely high standard uh, by Bradley, justifiably so, because if you're if you're going to take a uh, a journalistic shot at the president of the United States, you bet you bet you better not miss. Uh, but I think what what this episode, what the whole movie also kind of conveys, is this is the beginning of the shift in American journalism. I think away from essentially being a, a patsy or or, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, a stenographer for government officials and actually getting back into the mode of like a, a an IF stone or whatever um, in, in order to actually begin to kind of peel things back and to not take what they're told at face value. Uh, and, and if Donald Trump has done anything, um, I think it's probably helped to reinvigorate, <laughs> re, re, reinvigorate that, uh, that instinct among an awful lot of newsrooms and, and journalists in this country. Yeah, it, it seems like everybody, uh, whenever we make a, a movie about real historical events, everybody gets an upgrade. So, uh, you know, in terms of the actors that play them. So, like, uh, you know, nothing against Bob Woodward, but uh, Robert Redford is the, the hunkiest <laughs> actor of the, of the early 70s. Uh, my wife thinks Robert Redford is dreamy. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, Bernstein gets an upgrade to uh, 
uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman. I actually, I don't know if if, if any of you read this, uh, you know, in thinking about this movie over uh, the last week, uh, but apparently Redford wanted to cast Al Pacino as Bernstein. Huh. It, it was between it was between Pacino and uh, and Woodward and uh, sorry and uh, Hoffman. Um, wow, yeah, that would have so changed the dynamic. It definitely had to. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure anyone who was inclined to go into journalism, just the story of Woodward and Bernstein was uh, was pretty inspiring. But then uh, when it becomes uh, a hit movie uh, where, uh, you know, you could aspire to be Robert Redford uh, or Dustin Hoffman uh, going to, you know, going to battle with sinister, shadowy forces in the government, uh, it definitely did uh you know, give a shot in the arm to, to adversarial journalism. There's that um, funny bit that like, I think for contemporary viewers, they'll find it odd, the whole emphasis on notes, how it's always like, oh, uh, during a conversation, <laughs> yeah. did you get that down? Did you write it on a piece of paper? Because yeah. once you do, it's evidence now. Yeah. And like, that's going to feel very odd to uh -huh. us because like, if you're naturally going to say, well, well, couldn't they have just made something up? They just wrote it on a napkin. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> And it's a very different – now, we have an echo of that today where, you know, James Comey, after his meeting with Donald Trump, uh, went right back to the office and wrote down on a piece of paper what Trump told him because he was disturbed by it. He wanted some sort of cont near contemporaneous record. And that's an echo of that moment, but it's a, a pale echo. But back then, it's because all these folks knew each other and people trusted – the institutions, and I, by institutions, I don't just mean like the literal, the paper or the press. I mean the the institutions that govern kind of norms in DC journalism and politics. And so, your people had the sense of like your word is your bond, and if you violated that as a journalist, sources wouldn't come to you in the future. There would be consequences for making stuff up. And if you trust people to tell the truth. And it's an exception to the rule when they don't tell the truth. Well, then you can have lesser evidentiary standards and get away with it. So just yeah. writing something down, if you think someone generally tells the truth, well, you wrote it down and I tr tend, I'm inclined to trust you, that's enough. But today where we have much lower levels of societal trust in general, that's not going to cut it. Unless it's on tape, it didn't happen. Unless Donald Trump comes out of the van literally saying, I'm I like sexually harassing women, it doesn't happen. Right. The the parts where the, they're, uh, you know, we need to confirm this. I'm going to uh, we're going to be on the phone for 10 <laughs> seconds. And if you don't hang up, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, that means it's confirmed. Uh, yeah. You know, and today we're you know, we we, we tend not to trust. Uh, and I think for for good reasons, in some cases, uh, stories that uh where, where it's anonymous sources, highly placed White House official. Some of the stuff they're doing in this movie, uh, it, you know, the way they, they try to get different claims confirmed uh, seemed, you know, a, a step beyond that even. Well, and then the, the, the interesting thing, too, was, was they go to Sloan and they, and they go to him a couple of times, right? And, and then, you know, in their second interview with him at the end, I say, you know, would we be wrong essentially to say that Haldeman was involved, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, I would have no problem with you saying that. But he does not reveal, he does not reveal to them, of course, uh, because to do so would have would have been illegal at that point, uh, that he did not, he was not asked about Haldeman, you know, in the grand jury. So there they are, you know, kind of, you know, metaphorically with their asses hanging out in the wind there uh, on, on that particular uh, point. But then, you know, it turns out that uh, you know, the grand jury uh, investigation uh, was not what it should have been necessarily. And this gets to your point, Patrick, which like the um, – we live in just a very different conceptual universe. And we actually share the 70s conceptual universe more than they did, say, the 1950s conceptual universe. And again, that level uh, of institutional trust – uh, went from yeah. very high to very low very, very quickly. And we're, yeah. we're all cynical and jaded, and it fits well with a libertarian worldview, so we're all pretty comfortable <laughs> with that. Um, and, and most Americans are like us. Yeah, I mean, like, but that was learned behavior. In the 1950s, people, you know, it once used to be harder to become an FBI G-man 
than it was to get into an Ivy League school because people trusted government institutions that they shouldn't have. I and mean, we know all the terrible stuff the <laughs> FBI was up to in terms of civil liberties now, but people trusted the office of the president. People trusted Congress. People used to, a majority of people used to say, I trust Congress to do the right thing. C can you imagine? It's, and this is the moment where all that is falling apart in a matter of, of a decade, basically. Um, the stuff going on with the Pentagon Papers, with Watergate, with the, the uncovery of all of this skullduggery. Um, and we really do, the, the, the conceptual universe just changes in a matter of years, and it leaves people discombobulated and uh, alienated. It also leads to, I mean, I think, as you point out, Patrick, the rise of conspiracism. Um, I mean, we've always had conspiracy theories in American politics. It's a constant, but they really peak when institutional trust declines. And one of the examples I, I give when I talk about uh, Watergate um, is that the the biggest bump in belief in the Kennedy assassination conspiracy theories, you know, JFK has his head blown off in Dealey Plaza. The biggest bump doesn't come within a, a, a decade after Kennedy actually being assassinated, it comes after Watergate. And suddenly, if you poll people, do you believe in the official narrative about Kennedy being assassinated? It goes from an overwhelming, overwhelming majority saying yes for the first decade afterwards to a majority of people saying no after Watergate, right? So we all view the past through our particular, through the lens of the present. But all that means is that trust in government institutions, in this case, plummeted because of Watergate and the, the, the mess of the, of the early 1970s. So again, and that's a universe we move in. Now conspiracy theories are just part of the warp and wolf of politics from birtherism to 9-11 trutherism to Hunter Biden's laptop, uh, <laughs> which is our version of the Canuck letter. That's <laughs> possibly, I mean, it might, Canuck letter was totally fabricated. We still don't know with Hunter Biden, but that's, that is functionally what, how those two pieces, that's our corollary today. You know, one of the one of the great missed opportunities in the movie, and, and there was really nothing that I think they could necessarily do about it. But what was it at the end of the day that motivated felt, you know, to do what he did in, in, in going to uh, going to uh, to Bob Woodward? And, and I think, you know, obviously Woodward and Bernstein, you know, kept that secret right up until virtually the day that felt died until, you know, felt himself, you know, finally outed himself, um, decades, decades after the fact. Wasn't it like but 2005, I, I, right? Or yeah, I mean, it was, yes, it was in that decade. I mean, it was in, I think yeah. it was basically during the first, first Bush 43 term. And, and yeah. I think that, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, in, in some of the notes I put together for this uh, to share with you all, I, I, I actually did take the time. I haven't gone through every single one of, of, the, of the FBI files released on Mark Felt. But when you, when you actually look at his career, you know, this guy was very much the company man. And, and he wound up, you know, he had his share of screw ups along the way. That's for sure. But Hoover, you know, came to rely on him and a certain other group of folks, you know, Clyde Tolson and, and some of the others at the very senior levels, because they were A, totally loyal to him, but B, because some of them, like Felt, were really skilled at working the press, you know, in, in this, in this pre-scandal era and getting incredibly favorable coverage for the Bureau. So he was an asset, but at the same time, because he did all this espionage work during World War II. And so he developed counterintelligence techniques and procedures and all the rest of that. And at the same time, developed these skills, you know, working for the press. In a lot of respects, he was like the ideal guy to go and do this. What, what's lacking, unfortunately, in the movie, you know, is, is the motivation. And for me, that's, that's kind of the, the missing piece. And it's worth noting that Felt himself had been involved in, um, doing illegal wiretapping and surveillance yes. of the under of the weather underground of a yes. left wing kind of domestic sure. terrorist he was group. prosecuted for it and pardoned by uh, pardoned by Ronald Reagan. Yeah. 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 So he could have he could have been in Watergate. That, that could have been felt, <laughs> but he just sure. happened to end up on the other side, if you will. The uh, my recollection of felt, uh, which is sure is not as uh, fresh as Pat's, but um, it was a case of, uh, you know, he was passed over. And he yes. was a big uh, fan yes. of uh, of Hoover's, and he didn't like what was happening at the FBI. So it was, uh, you know, they used the the term 
uh, rat f***ing in the, uh, <laughs> in the, if I can say that, it's in the movie. Um, yeah, you got it. <laughs> and in a way, what he was doing was was his own version of, of that uh, because he'd, he'd been passed over. Uh, and it's sort of one of these things that, you know, there have been the, whenever there's a whistleblower, uh, there, there's a discussion about, you know, their motivations. Was Snowden a Russian spy? You know, was Daniel Ellsberg this or that? Uh, Watergate is one of those cases where here you have, well, not a whistleblower in the sense that he he comes public at the time, but you have somebody that's leaking, uh, and his motivations uh, are not really public spirited uh, as much as careerist or, or petty. Um, but, you know, what, what really matters is what happened, uh, not the motivations for leaking it. Well, what's interesting to me is when the movie ends, when it does chronologically. Uh, so we break so much news and then what, what Paul was talking about, the long history of Watergate and the, the years that it takes for hearings to be undergone and charges to be pressed and then for Nixon to resign and everything. Why do you think the movie ends when it does? Uh, is there an importance to that? It, it, was that a, an important choice? How would it have been a different film from the film noir, you know, detective on the case if it was, you know, much more of a we're going to have dramatic congressional hearing reenactments where they, you know, really heighten everything when it was in reality probably a much more boring thing to watch uh, if, you, if you weren't <laughs> there or knew what was going on? Well, I, I was actually, you know, when I first saw the film, I was actually kind of surprised that they didn't take the opportunity, you know, to work in, you know, John Dean's, you know, cancer on the presidency, you know, testimony or Howard Baker asking that, you know, what did the president know and when did the president know it? Um, you know, I, I think that that would have that would have added, you know, some real dramatic effect, I, I think. I think it would have helped to kind of reinforce the magnitude of it, right, the, the gravity of the whole thing. So I was a little bit surprised by that. Um, but, but I think if, you know, if the purpose was to just, you know, kind of, we've already given you two hours of this, you know, we think you, we think you kind of know the rest of the story here, but in case you've forgotten, and then the teletype goes, right? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it was a terrific choice. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I think if you do, you hit all the high points of the whole uh, saga, you end up, uh, it's like a docudrama. And, uh, you know, as Paul pointed out, people have been watching these hearings. Uh, you know, if they're familiar with uh, some of these bit players, they're certainly familiar. They've heard what did the president know and when did he know it? And Butterfield, uh, you know, revealing the tapes and they, they've heard all of this. And, uh it, it it would just be like watching what you just watched, but with actors, and you you know you're always thinking in historical dramas like, does that guy really look like Richard Nixon? You know Anthony <laughs> Hopkins, and only Frank Langella is allowed to play yeah. Nixon. <laughs> but but it it you know people know how the story comes out. I think it's kind of uh, neat the way almost all the major players are uh, are kept off stage you know you see you hear nixon you see uh the inaugural footage uh, you hear his voice you you see some testimony but they're all on tv and basically off stage uh, and i think ending it when they did uh you know there's still a little bit of mystery to this thing that we already know how it comes out you know what I think I would like to see as a follow. I mean, this movie I I, I like it as it is, but uh, a follow up movie. You know, the first time you history plays as tragedy, and the second time is farce. Is that like you? I'm reminded this is um this is like the House of Cards portrayal of of government skullduggery, in which it's if you've seen House of Cards, it's you know all these hyper competent, ambitious, scheming politicians doing very clever stuff. <laughs> Um, right. The, but, but the reality is a little bit cl is is not that it's it's also not West Wing. It's something closer it's to Veep. Veep right? It's Veep. Yes. Veep. <laughs> but the reality is actually it's not even Veep. It's somewhere in the middle. Right. We need Veep and House of Cards and West Wing somewhere triangulated in the middle. Now, the great line from this, my favorite quote is the truth is these are not very bright guys and things got out of hand. 
So off of that quote, let's Truth. see a, a sequel to this, which is played <laughs> from the perspective of the bunglers, of the bungler, bunglers in Creep, of the bunglers in the Watergate burglary, of they're running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Um, in response to this investigation, I mean, remember, it's Nixon doesn't resign because of Watergate. He resigns because of his role in the cover up. And he it was an in incredible, incompetently managed cover up. So I would love to see the flip <laughs> of this, of it played as parody as these political incompetents run around um, desperately trying to stem the bleeding from Watergate and end up you know, screwing themselves as a result. Yeah. Um, I'm also reminded, though, if that these are the not very bright guys. Um, our corollary today is, is, is really quite striking because like, if that's, <laughs> if they were the dumb version, what does that say about the incredible incompetence of current scandals afflicting, uh, afflicting the, uh, the executive branch? That quote got a lot of play o over the, the last couple of years. Uh, Ken White and Pope hat, uh, <laughs> has used that quote, uh, you know, not very bright guys repeatedly, uh, because, uh, if it applied to, the, the Nixon gang, it, it certainly applies in spades to this gang. Which raises the question, why why did they not get away with it back then? Why have uh, has the imperial executive gotten away with it today? I mean, that's, that's I think, one of the questions I try to get my, my students to think about. And part of it is that the back then we weren't afflicted by the same kind of uh, political rot that we uh, see now. And like back then, so so the book I would recommend is Michael uh, Conowitz's They Said No to Nixon, Republicans Who Stood Up to the President's Abuses of Power. Great little history about people like Senator Barry Goldwater, who went to Nixon and said, hey, look, we're not going to defend you if you're impeached. You're you're going to be convicted. We're going to vote for impeachment, or the House will vote for impeachment, and then we'll we'll vote to convict you if once you know once it comes to the Senate. So you should resign, or else you're going to go down. You're going to be successfully removed from office. There's that doesn't happen today. We we know that doesn't happen today because we had an impeachment <laughs> trial earlier this year, and there was no movement from even even those who you know the only movement we got was Mitt Romney. But Mitt Romney's no Barry Goldwater. Um, there's not enough, though. Yeah. Well, in, in, the, in the House, Justin Amash, of course. But did that, that really kind of goes to your point. And, and I think, um, you know, having, having worked up there myself for over 10 years and, you know, lobbyists for a decade before that, um, I've, I've been shocked at the level of degradation just in the last decade. You know, I mean, it's been really, really bad. But, you know, on, on that committee, uh, House Judiciary Committee, you had 17 Republicans. And even then, only a third of them, you know, seven of them were willing to vote for. But, you know, right now that looks like all star. Right. I mean, compared to <laughs> co compared to, co compared to where we are now. And, and I think it just gets down to and, and if folks have not listened um, to the podcast uh, on free thoughts that Aaron, uh, Aaron Powell and Trevor Burris did with Justin Amash earlier this year, I cannot emphasize enough. What an absolutely wonderful hour. I mean, it's a depressing hour, but it's, it's a wonderful hour of listening to an incredibly intelligent, thoughtful, uh, and deeply frustrated legislator talk about, in essence, why we are where we are. Um, and I think one of the critical realities, and I, I agree with Justin on this completely, and I think this goes back to the Watergate era, what was different about it then, is that you had powerful committee chairmen like Sam Irvin, Right. And, and, you, and you had guys like Frank Church um, and, and, yes, John Tower, who was the, who was the vice chair of, of the church committee. Um, these guys had the power because that's how things were structured back then. But you've had this radical centralization of, of power in Congress at the very top where this is where the money is doled out. And, and this is where, uh, the, the, you know, uh, you, you make the deal essentially with leadership that you'll go along. You'll basically turn your voting card over to them. I'm virtually channeling a mosh right now when, I, when I'm using these phrases. Uh, <laughs> and, in, and, and in return, uh, we will defeat any primary challenger who comes after you. Uh, we will turn on the spigot of money. You'll get whatever committee assignment you want. Uh, you just have to do what we tell you to do, you know, when we tell you to do it. That, that is not a functioning legislature. It's just that simple. It's not. And I think that's a key difference between then and the Watergate era uh, and what we're dealing with now. So, yeah, it, that, that, that's what frightens me, I think, maybe more than anything else. 
um, is the is the essentially you know the Article One of our Constitution right now just not functioning? Yeah, the it's parties control their congressional delegations to an extent that they just did not half a century ago. Uh, there's a lot more individual independence and individual power um, where they could tell party leadership, no, uh, you know, I. I'm going to be reelected in Arizona. I'm Barry Goldwater. I could I can do whatever I want. My career is not at jeopardy. But today, you get a you get a MAGA primary challenger if you vote for impeachment. You you there's consequences. Justin Mash being the perfect example of that, um, and that that's also paired with general political polarization in the electorate. Like today, unlike back then, when people used to split ticket, people used to vote for different parties for different positions at a significantly higher rate than they do now. But now, even though we hate the parties, we feel like we have to vote for them. If we don't vote for our party, it's the an existential threat to America. Every election is the last, potentially the last election. And that kind of thinking rots away any willingness to think about country over party. Um, I mean, we're at the point where if you poll people, they are more likely to say, uh, I'm trying to remember where, I don't know if this is a Gallup poll, but people are more likely to say, if my child comes to me and wants my approval for a, a marriage with some with another person, I am less comfortable with them marrying someone from another political affiliation than I am if they are a different race or a different religion. In other words, tribal politics are more powerful than racism or religious difference in America today. That, that's pretty striking. So we're, we're in a mess. And the, this is downstream consequence of that is the difference between Nixon's impeachment versus Trump's impeachment. Throughout this conversation, we have been talking a lot about paranoia and kind of how the, the movie plays into like the paranoia of the era and how that's still very, uh, very much felt today. And I was wondering if we if we rewind a little bit, why was the White House so paranoid that they wanted to uh, they wanted to have not they wanted to have this Watergate scandal, but that they wanted to break into the DNC? I want to know why that paranoia started originally. Well, there's I mean, so you know Nixon in 1960 he loses very narrowly. Uh, he it's the closest uh, election of the 20th century, other than Bush v. Gore in 2000. Whether 2000 is part of the 20th century, it's a it's very narrow. You know, just a few thousand votes in the popular vote. Um, two states would have made a difference. In fact, it was a stolen election. So we know historians of the 60 election will note that Louisiana and, and Illinois uh, probably should they should have gone to Nixon, but the state Democratic Party political machines packed the ballot boxes through the election um, and basically rigged it for Kennedy. So, and Nixon knew that. So Nixon knew he had lost very narrowly in 1960. It almost ended his political career. No one in 1961 would have thought Nixon would someday be president. He had his shot. He missed it. Um, so Nixon, and Nixon is by nature kind of a paranoid guy, but he had that impulse. He lost one real narrowly. So Anytime he and back then polling wasn't as good as it is today, so he never trusted the polls. So even though it looked like he was sailing towards re-election in 1972, uh, he just never believed it in his bones. He was always worried that each election would be like 1960 again. So there's that moment in the movie where that one of the uh, uh, Washington Post editors said, "I don't buy your story because why would the Republicans do it?" And a lot of that has to be rooted in the individual paranoia of Richard Nixon. I mean, he, he was the kind of guy who um, he would sit in the Oval Office late at night at like 2 a.m. and read critical coverage of himself, take little notes and send them to his creep operatives, to people like Haldeman and Colson, tell them to like take them do down a notch, like plant a rumor about them being unfaithful to their wife with a sympathetic media outlet. He would be up at 3 a.m. in the morning in his little, he actually had a secret office. He wouldn't do this in the Oval Office. He would do it in his little secret office, obsessing over coverage of himself. Does that remind you of someone just minus 140 <laughs> characters? <laughs> right? Um, yeah. but I, I would say that Nick, Nixon was especially paranoid, but uh, what's striking is uh, what he went down for. Uh, so much of it, you know, he wasn't an innovator in uh, <laughs> presidential skullduggery. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of what uh, came out of Watergate was uh, them trying to do 
on a, an ad hoc basis what uh, LBJ and JFK and others had used actual intelligence agencies for. Uh, Hoover at this point in his life was getting cold feet about uh, things like COINTELPRO and about uh, you know political spying. Um, and uh, that's part of the reason for the birth of the plumbers. And uh, but but if you look at, uh, you know, LBJ had uh, the I believe it was a CIA bug Barry Goldwater's uh, campaign plane, uh, you know, JFK uh, used the IRS uh, to harass his political opponents uh, and anyone who, who got in his way. A lot of what comes out in Watergate is Nixon doing that or trying that sort of thing much less effectively. Uh, so there was nothing particularly, this isn't whataboutism. Nixon clearly deserved to be impeached, uh, but maybe we missed a, a, a couple of his predecessors too. There was nothing, uh, there was nothing that he had done. And it, that's, uh, one of the reasons, uh, that he thought he could get away with it. And there was a, uh, uh, a little bit of a backlash on the right. There's uh, somebody named a uh, journalist named Victor Lasky who wrote a best-selling book called "It Didn't Start with Watergate." Uh, that goes into that went into some of uh, this history of uh, Nixon's predecessors abusing intelligence agencies. He was trying to make the point that that means it, that means it was okay and Nixon shouldn't have been impeached because he only did what he got caught for what these other guys got away with. Um, you know, I don't think that's the conclusion you want to draw. Uh, but it, so some of this is is Nixon's particular paranoia. But spying on political enemies uh, it was not was not something he innovated. Yeah. Well, as I put, I've I've said this bef uh, in I think I said it in my book, but the difference between Nixon and Kennedy when it comes to the abuse of executive power is that Nixon got caught. That's right. it. Right. Like uh, there, there's a little line in that movie that uh, I found interesting uh, when it's early on when uh, Bradley spikes the story and uh, and Bernstein slash Hoffman says he's just carrying water for the Kennedys or something like that. Um, there's a backstory there uh, where, you know, Ben Bradley was a, was a real chum of. Bobby and, and Jack. Uh, and, you know, he had actually been, it's in uh, one of his memoirs. He has a, a book Bradley did called uh, Conversations with, with Kennedy. And he recounts this story of uh, around the time of the, uh, the steel strike about uh, Bobby and JFK laughing about how they, uh, uh, you know, sick the FBI and the IRS on steel executives because they they raised prices, uh, you know, and Brad they knew that Ben Bradley wasn't going to report that at the time because uh, they were pals. Uh, he knew all about uh, you know JFK's uh, supercharged libido and uh, extracurricular activities. Uh, part of it was that wasn't done really at, at the time. Um, but part of it was uh, he was very cozy with the Kennedys. And I think after Watergate, um, you have more of you, you have liberal journalists who are willing to call out and expose bad behavior by Democratic presidents. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe in part because of the, the, the mythos that, that grows up around Woodward and Bernstein. You you had a you had a question an email that uh, I thought was uh, you know right on for how I experienced the movie, uh, which was I, I had rewatched this maybe within the last two or three years, you know, when impeachment was uh, was gearing up, and I have to say, like, your question was about uh, uh, journalism in this time without cell phones and Google. When yeah. <laughs> I rewatched it the first time, it's like literally all I could focus on was the technology. <laughs> and uh, <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember like uh, regular typewriters and stuff. Uh, I can only imagine, you know, if younger millennials or Zoomers watching this thing and it's like, 
they're, they're making phone calls. They want to find something. They want to find out who Howard Hunt is. They call down to like this little library in the basement of the Washington Post. They're writing on, <laughs> uh, little bits of paper. Uh, everybody's smoking, you know, in elevators. And uh, I, it really, uh, I don't know, just kind of a side point, I guess. But uh, the, it, it was almost like a, a an inadvertent, uh, homage to uh old tech you know like yeah. uh, <laughs> it, it, it made you realize how much the world had changed and some of some of it must just look absolutely bizarre if you if you have no living memory of some of these things it's funny that you bring that up, up gene because i was thinking while i was watching it like how much current are how current journalists should really admire this movie because like when you think of investigative journalism like that like this movie is like kind of what you think of like you're on the ground you're like looking for you're looking for the facts that no one can find you're going through hard co hard copies of library records um and like stuff like that whereas i feel like that does obviously doesn't happen as much today with cell phones and with Google and being able to reach each other much more readily, especially in investigative journalism. And I think uh, journalists today should really admire and also consider themselves rather lucky uh, that their their profession has changed and uh, what changed with technology. But I also think it's it's also kind of sad in a way that like journalism doesn't happen that way anymore um and that it's uh, a lot of the connections are like a lot of what take took a significant amount of time in the past like hunting these people down in person or trying to find paper records of things doesn't happen as often today and i mean that that was just kind of something i noticed throughout the movie <laughs> yeah it's much more cinematic the, like the shoe leather journalism going to people's houses like uh putting out this red flag and go into a parking garage <laughs> in Roslyn. Right. <laughs> uh, whereas now if you, with the, I, I didn't see the Snowden movie, uh, that had some dramatic, the story has some dramatic features, but a lot of journalism would be, uh, you know, in, in cinema now would be guys sitting at a desk. Yeah, it'd be a lot of, right. you know, getting on Twitter, hop, checking your DMs, yes. you know. <laughs> but what's so, you can tell that this movie was made when it was because when the phone rings, the journalist doesn't go into a panic and screen the call and then, you know, just, and then just text the number back saying, who is this? They actually pick up and just say hello, which a millennial or a Zoomer would never do. It, it would be less compelling if like 90% of the phone calls ended with your vehicle warranty is, you know, yeah. uh, 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 <laughs> robocalls. Um, I'll add one thing here. I don't know if it, if it fits in or not. Um, I, I thought the role of, of gender in the movie was really interesting. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, you know, four out of five of us here are guys. But so, but what was interesting about it is that it's a movie that ostensibly is about men. Right, the journalists are men. Yes. The people, the creep people are men. It's a, it is a real, you know, uh, men, 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 men kind of party. But the reality is, and you can see this in the movie. I'm not sure this was an intentional subtext. I don't think it occurred to the authors of the film. Uh, but, you know, I'd be open to being wrong. Is that is the importance of women at every point in the story? So yes. most of the leads are yes. generated by women. What's yes. interesting is that they are generated by those women precisely because of the misogyny because of, men. of the time yeah because, well because well because they're overlooked no, no so like they would have you know these people would do things they would shred documents they would have conversations and because they took the w women for granted it was as if they were invisible in the office hmm. but they weren't right they were watching they were listening and so they're able to be key conduits of information to these journalists so it's actually kind of fascinating that the kind of patriarchal misogyny of Washington in the 1970s helped bring down the system. And you can kind of see that it's a subtext you have to read uh, kind of against the grain in the movie, but for it's sure. there if you look for it. Yeah. But but all that stuff where it's like, hey, wasn't your that that girl you used to try to go with? It's very <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like um, or them pressuring the woman being like, it being like, oh, he was there in your apartment. To sleep with. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, all, some of those were so or, awkward. Uh, yeah. Bernstein, 
Bernstein practically dragging uh, the the one woman by the yeah. arm through the yes. office. You're like, what are you doing? Yes. Or or him yeah. shoving his way into the house and her being like, please leave. And him being like, I'm just going to have a cup of coffee yeah. and smoke a cigarette. Just ask you a bunch <laughs> right. of questions. Yeah. Now yeah. it would be like, get out of her house, you <laughs> creep. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that hasn't aged well, but it is actually really interesting to think about. And it, it's a time you have that juxtaposition. It's 1970s. So women are still, you know, there's still a strong glass ceiling, but their numbers in the workforce are have been rising since the 50s. And so it's that juxtaposition of women being more present, but still overlooked and repressed and taken for granted. And so that may, you can see that in the background of this movie. Yeah. Well, Paul, it's also cool that you bring that up because as, as you said, it's like, it hasn't aged well, mind you, this, this movie is very old but i was just thinking about the movie that came out recently with uh the post who that stars meryl streep and how she's like the the key focus of that movie and if you just kind of juxtapose the two movies all the president's men and the post i think like women got more of their like time to shine in the post and that can also just shows you how far not only we've come in movie production and like the casting of roles but also how far we've come in like the portrayal of history. And I mean, I wouldn't say the portrayal is inaccurate though, from all the president's men in terms of like women's role in the workplace. And yeah, it hasn't aged well. A lot of things that happen in American history haven't aged well at all. Um, but I think the post kind of gave the movie, I think that was like, I think it was 2017 or 2016 that it came out, but definitely gave women a little bit more of the limelight um, whether or not the post was accurate, I don't, I'm not sure, but I think, I think it's interesting to juxtapose those two. For sure. Yeah. And there's, I mean, as historians, we talk about, uh, it's not so much accuracy or not accuracy. It's what you choose to leave silent or make salient. And the, it, and all the president's men makes a particular story salient and it's a very male story and it's not inaccurate. It's just what they made silent and salient. Um, there, but yeah, the post, it is kind of outrageous that the only way in which uh, Catherine Graham, who is the owner of the Washington Post, shows up in All the President's Men is in a throwaway line from a former attorney general who says, tell Katie Graham she's going to get her tit caught in the ringer if you run this story. Katie Which is Graham, historically accurate, right? It you is. did say that. <laughs> yeah. It is accurate. But like yeah. she, she was actually far more than Woodward or Bernstein, who were young reporters – Yes, there was some heroism involved that could have hurt their careers if they gotten the story wrong. She was the real brave one. So Catherine Graham uh, owns not just the Washington Post. She owns uh, several radio, uh, uh, television station licenses. And the, the Nixon administration leans on her. Don't let your journalists, don't let your editors. I mean, they're, they're under her. Don't let them run this story. And they tell that story in the Post in the movie pretty well. To the point where uh, Nixon actually has the FCC change its uh, cross-media ownership rules to punish her and force her to divest herself of her much more profitable television stations. Like, she's actually the, a bigger hero than – I mean, she's the real heroine in all this. Like, without her holding the line, none of this journalism stuff would have happened. And and so I, so it is – you can – again, what you, what you make salient and what you make silent. And here she's all but silent except for a sexist remark. And now for the time on the show where we get to share all of the other pieces of media that we've been enjoying during our lockdown. This is Locked In. So, Pat, Gene, Paul, uh, what else have you been enjoying with your time at home? <laughs> I, I think I've, I've found that a lot of podcasts essentially have begun to really kind of grow on me in a lot of ways. And uh, in addition to Pop and Lock, of course, and, and uh, Free Thoughts, I've become fairly addicted uh, to anything that, that the Lincoln Project puts out. Um, it's, it's really become a staple for me just in terms of following, you know, what's happening in the battleground races and all the rest of that. Uh, and then uh, in a lighter vein, um, I am waiting with bated breath for season two of The Mandalorian. Uh, it would be fair to say that I'm pretty <laughs> fanatical about the show, uh, pretty fanatical about Star Wars uh, in any event. And I, and I, I think that Star Trek's uh, Discovery Season 3, I mean, the, the, the initial episode was pretty interesting. Um, I'm not going to give it away for folks who have not been, you know, kind of following it. But uh, 
yeah, I mean that that's that's kind of what I'm living for now, and and I. I am concerned, as I think many people are, that the longer this goes on, the less original content that we're going to have from our yeah. friends in Hollywood and elsewhere. <laughs> it's going to have us all really climbing the walls. But uh, yeah, and uh, and then finally, I just have a, a boatload of books that I've uh, you know picked up uh, as part of my my book project research and all the rest of that that I'm you know trying to get through. Um, but yeah, those are the big things for me right now. Well, I have. Uh... An almost one-year-old and an almost four-year-old. So uh, uh, my <laughs> lockdown has not been uh, a, 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 a an opportunity to catch up on all the, the TV and books that I would have liked to have. Uh, <laughs> watching a little more Disney Plus than uh, than I might have liked. <laughs> Although I was uh, surprised and uh, kind of ashamed uh that uh i ended up liking hamilton more than i intended to uh uh recently i read uh the ton of new ton of french novel the searcher uh which is pretty good but not as good as uh her dublin murder squad series uh on tv i caught dublin murders which is uh a uh uh, uh i think it's a bbc a uh, mini series production of uh two of her earlier books which is flawed but uh also has its moments um what else oh uh on this general subject it's not some it's something i read a few years ago but uh there's a a book by thomas mallon uh called watergate a novel uh where it's a uh, uh it's not exactly true to history. He, he explains some things we don't know the answer to with, with a lot of literary license. But uh, as Washington novels go, it's pretty interesting. And if you are, if you like to read historical novels and, uh, you know, it's a sort of a low impact way to learn a little history if you're interested in Watergate, um, with the caveat that some of it uh, is literary license. And I believe he explains the parts that he that he made up uh, in a one part of the book. Um, Thomas Thomas Mallon Watergate, a novel, uh, is a lot of fun. I'll add for myself. Um, it was suggesting reading material. Uh, so I had a an op ed in the New York Times uh, last week talking about the importance of talk radio that touched briefly on radio in the 1960s and Kennedy's censorship campaign against conservative broadcasters. Uh, we've, I mentioned, we mentioned here today briefly, Nixon did a lot of the same stuff that Kennedy did, and that includes with targeting uh, critical broadcasters, those who criticize his administration on the radio. Uh, so if you're interested in a really another sordid tale of actual government conspiracies, the silence, political dissent, I mean, look up my book. Yeah, uh, The Radio Right, How a Band of Broadcasters Took on the Federal Government and Built the Modern Conservative Movement. Um, the more fun thing that I've been doing, uh, like Eugene, more Disney Plus in my diet than I would normally prefer since I have a six-year-old. But I did introduce him to the best non-Pixar Disney movie, in my opinion, uh, Big Hero 6, and uh, which... Uh, Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, uh, didn't get a sequel because Disney has a habit of flogging its IP into the ground. Um, but Big Hero 6, I realized while I was watching, I was like, you know what's really anachronistic about this or, or fantastical about this? It's not actually the tech. I mean, the tech is fantastical and most of it doesn't exist. Uh, but, you know, a healthcare companion is imaginable. But I was reminded while watching it that the most fantastical element is actually the fact that a key plot point involves Baymax the robot, uh, and spoilers here, it involves Baymax the robot scanning the health of everyone in San Fran, Tokyo, um, <laughs> without their consent, and then sharing that information with third parties. Oh this is God. a gross violation of, of HIPAA, uh, medical privacy regulations. And so that's, I mean, it ruined the movie for me once I realized that that was true. It's, it's actually a really great film. Um, I am going to have to have a conversation with my son about uh, HIPAA now. So, you know, <laughs> as a six-year-old, I'm not sure how much we'll, we'll filter through, but we'll try. Oh, one, one more on Disney Plus. Uh, oh, yeah. The, uh, uh, the recent live-action version of The Jungle Book, 
Uh, I, oh so, yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to. Little kids want to write, watch movies like seventy times, <laughs> and so this is one that I've watched like seventy times, and I still enjoy. Uh, Idris Elba is uh, Shere Khan, the the tiger uh, is fantastic. Everybody's great. Bill Murray is Baloo the bear, um, and it's actually uh, th- there's a probably more of the original Kipling stories in it than there than there was in the uh, original cartoon version of the Jungle Book. Uh, I, so pleasantly surprised by that one. Yeah, on the on the TV and movie front for me, I just finished the last season of The 100, which I'm sad about because I've been dedicated to this show for seven seasons now. And it had a satisfying ending, though not great and rather predictable, but, you know, I'll, I'll be okay. Um, and then I am very close to finishing the la- the most recent Hunger Games book, which is actually the prequel. And it's like a story about um, President Snow when he was a child. Um, I, I like the book, but I also like am under the impression that I'm, the only reason I'm reading it is because I liked the original Hunger Games books when I was younger. Um, and I don't think I would have necessarily picked up the book had I not had all of the the three previous books. Um, And then I'm also starting to read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. It is another, uh, it's another novel that's like kind of in the mystery crime genre, I'll say. Um, I just started it, so I don't don't have a, a whole lot of information on that. And then the last thing is I am rather quickly uh, going through Shit's Creek. It's the first time I've watched it, but I think <laughs> with all the buzz going on lately, I should probably join the bandwagon. So I'm already into season three, which is embarrassing because I think the last recording I said I had just finished season one and that was like a week ago. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> that, that's kind of what I've been up to. <laughs> Have you been tempted to do uh, drop a, you know, David or do it to Aaron? Aaron. <laughs> sometime. Not yet. Two meetings. <laughs> Not yet. But uh the show's really good and it's it's one of those that's super easy to like watch and if you if you like uh, for me, if I like fall asleep or if I miss part of an episode, it's not like a huge deal. You can just go on to the next one. And I, I like having those shows, especially like if I'm working from home sometimes for noise in the background. Yeah, uh, that's what we call uh, or what my wife likes to call her panic show during the pandemic is just the one that you can put on <laughs> in the background because you know what's going to happen and it's it's comforting. Hers has been The Office uh, up until now. We have watched and rewatched and rewatched and rewatched The Office for months now, but just just this past week or so, we have pivoted to uh, the Great British Bake Off um, oh. on Netflix, and we've burned through about three seasons of that in a week, um, just learning all about how to make a wonderful crumb and not to get a soggy bottom on our pies. <laughs> um, shout out to Mary Berry, my girl. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we've been watching a lot of uh, of GBBO, as I call it, Great British Bake Off. Um, another podcast that I am excited is coming back is Heavyweight, uh, which is produced by Gimlet Media, uh, and it's it's hosted by Jonathan Goldstein, who, if you've listened to This American Life, uh, he is a very big contributor to that for several years, and he had a show on the CBC called Wiretap, um, and he basically helps people that have basically had a, a like a relationship in their past go awry or there's some unresolved conflict that they have in their past and he helps them meet that person and, and sort of resolve that conflict. Um, and there's some that are, you know, really silly and it's like uh, I was a guy that gave Moby – the DJ musician, a bunch of CDs that he then used for like famous samples in a song. And the guy, he tracks down Moby and they go and meet with Moby and they have to like rectify the situation and get, get them to apologize. Um, but there's also like really, really touching ones about families getting back together. And his sort of voice as a writer is pretty much unlike anyone else right now, I think. Um, he's, he's very distinct. So if you want something very different um, with a very distinct voice and you like podcasts, check out Heavyweight. Uh, I've also been obsessed uh, with uh, watching a lot of YouTube videos uh, from this uh, channel called Game Maker's Toolkit with Mark Brown. Uh, it's all about video game design, but it's it's very, very intelligently done. He He talks about like 
the use of audio and and level design and how like side scrolling games you know how they came to be and how that sort of mapped the way video game players view what video games should be and how stories evolve and and it's just a really interesting uh you know from a design perspective how video games work um and I recently saw a video from the channel uh, People Make Games about the uh, game of Blaseball. That's baseball with an L after the B. Um, and it is an online game that you can go on. And it is basically a simulated baseball league um, where all of the variables that determine how successful certain players or teams are are just wacky and weird and the, and they're always introducing new ones like weather but the weather won't be like rain or shine it'll be like dust or nuclear cloud or blood rains from the skies uh <laughs> players can die in the middle of a season and then be what? resurrected they're like inhuman it's a strange thing that this huge cult following has sort of risen up around and now there's fan art and, and stories and fiction about all of these fake characters from fake baseball teams that they've invented and the developers are kind of listening to the the fans and responding to that and building mechanics in that the the players are interested in so it's it's an interesting sort of cultural fandom but also a, um, an interesting way of looking at simulations and and sports and all kinds of that so you get the the nerdy fan fiction side of the internet with the rabid sports following side and they marry with each other shockingly well and that's baseball. guess i know how i'll be spending my afternoon today <laughs> thanks for listening if you'd like to complain that we talked about this movie instead of the princess bride as i teased you can feel free to send us your complaints on twitter you can find us at the handle at pop and lock pod that's pop the letter n lock with an e like the philosopher pod make sure to subscribe to us on apple podcasts spotify or wherever you listen we look forward to unraveling your favorite show or movie next time. Pop and Lock is produced by me, Landry Ayers, as a project of libertarianism.org. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.